Ni hao and welcome to episode two of my blog about Mao's China. And last time we were looking a bit at the backdrop to the establishment of the People's Republic of China on the 1st of October 1949. Um, and from this episode on, we're looking at um, how Mao's China is molded and then run um, through all the way through to 1976. Um, and in these first few um, vlogs, we're having a look at the establishment of the People's Republic of China, thinking um, in particular, yeah, that's a big deal because the Kuomintang, as I explained last time, never really, although they were in charge of, of China for 20 plus years um, from 1927 onwards, uh, they never really had control of more than about a third of China in terms of geography and arguably less than that. Um, in terms of population and, and economy, particularly because Japan invaded in the early 30s. Um, and uh, arguably also, nobody had really had full control of China since, uh, well, since 1911, for sure, and maybe even earlier than that too. So it's a big deal that the Communist Party get in charge um, and uh, really uh, establish full control over China, which they dominate still to today. So we're going to think in this episode about the situation in 1949 um, and how the PRC, um, sorry, how the Chinese Communist Party overcame uh, opposition to them uh, in the PRC in the first few years. P PRC, by the way, People's Republic of China is just what we're going to call China from now on. Um, next time we'll talk about the political structure and we'll also start to think about the Korean War and the impact of that uh, upon uh, Mao and his regime. So the situation in 1949 uh, was really bad uh, when the Communist Party um, claimed victory in the Civil War. It still needs tidying up uh, after the 1st of October 1949, but they claimed victory at that point. Um, for a start, the Communist Party has no experience of running a country. The best they've been able to do is run kind of a, a province, less than a province really, uh, in the north of China, um, around Yan'an in the late 30s and then um, through the through the war kind of on the fringes of Japanese um, occupation and the impact of both um, the Sino-Japanese war um, which is part of the Second World War and then also the Civil War which had been going on both before and then uh, more uh, catastrophically after the Second World War the impact of those two wars is uh, three wars really in, in some ways um, had been um, really disastrous so in 1949 only Manchuria um, and the lower Yangtze um, and the eastern cities had any sort of transport or communication systems in place. It's a place where China as a whole is difficult to get around and difficult to move things around. Um, as Partly as a consequence of that, the economy is in a really bad place. Industrial output in 1945 had been 25% of pre-war levels. And that was the impact of the Japanese invasion. Uh, the Kuomintang had, um, in losing the Civil War, had uh, taken as anything that they could find that wasn't pinned down, um, including lots of kind of gold and silver, um, and they had taken that with them when they fled to Taiwan. Um, and uh, partly as a consequence of those two things, inflation in 1949 was running at 1,000%. So economically, it's a disastrous um, situation for the Communist Party to take over. Food production was 30% lower in 1945 than it had been in 1937, and it hadn't improved much since then by 1949. Only 15% of land in China was being cultivated under the current practice. So uh, on the plus side, enormous scope to improve, but actually it's a really um, uh, restricted situation. Partly as a result of all that, partly as a result of the war, of course, as well. In 1949, average life expectancy in China was only 36 years. Um, and uh, again, uh, feeding into that, there are only 40,000 doctors in China to care for a population of um, around 540 million people. So China was um, creaking, uh, to put it nicely, um, and the situation was um, hugely complex. And it's an enormous country for the Communist Party to take over. Added to which, there's still a nationalist threat in 1949, both on mainland China initially, and then also um, lurking at the edges um, in Taiwan uh, through our whole period. So uh, what did the Communist Party do? Well, um, they started off by running what they called reunification campaigns um, in various parts of, of the country. And the best way to think of this is basically in the fringes. Um, China, the Communist Party already has control of the eastern seaboard and the northeast. Um, but in the northwest, Xinjiang province, uh, which is spelled X-I-N-J-I-A-N-G, uh, was uh, Xinjiang province was um, uh, outside of their control. Xinjiang province is 80% uh, Uyghur, uh, which counterintuitively is about U Y G 
H-U-R. Um, the Uyghurs are Muslim people, and there were fears that the, the Muslim population would want independence or perhaps even uh, unite with the Soviet Union. Um, so they send uh, an army there to clamp down on that. And uh, you may be aware that even today there's controversy about the Communist Party's policies uh, in restricting and restraining the Uyghur population of Xinjiang. In the southeast, uh, in Guangdong province, um, was uh, a previous stronghold uh, of the Kuomintang. In fact, that had been where they had started out um, back at the start of the 20th century. Um, and again, another army was sent down there to clamp down on opposition. 130,000 people were rounded up in Guangzhou, um, this main city of Guangdong, and about half of those were executed. Um, and the other main place that they send an army to uh, is Tibet. Uh, Tibet had actually declared independence from China completely in 1911 when the monarchy had collapsed. Um, and it had been running its own affairs through the period from 1911 up to 1949. But the Communist Party decided that actually they need it back. Um, and so they send an army um, and they invade in October 1950. 60,000 Tibetans rally to the flag and they fight back, but they're overwhelmed within six months by the People's Liberation Army, the, uh, the Chinese Communist Party's army. Um, and again, as like Xinjiang, um, hugely um, uh, harsh penalties are put in place. Buddhism is in essence banned. The Dalai Lama is forced to flee, still hasn't been able to get back. Uh, Tibetan identity is crushed. I mean, a good example of this actually is that Beijing time is in, uh, installed, insisted upon throughout the whole of China. So again, even today, there's just one time zone in China. Um, to put that in context, uh, Tibet should be two hours behind China, um, uh, behind China, behind Beijing, but it's uh, at the same time. So everything there is happening two hours earlier, later than it should do. Can't really work it out. Anyway, when it's 10 o'clock in the morning in Beijing, it's also 10 o'clock in the morning in Tibet, but it should be 8 o'clock in the morning. You can write that out. Um, so uh, the, county, the the reunification campaigns um, establish a kind of a militaristic control over um, the fringe, the rebellious fringe of, uh, of China. Um, also, though, more generally, there's a campaign of terror and suppression of counter-revolutionaries, even within the parts where they had initially gained control already. There had been, for instance, 10 political parties in China uh, when the PRC was established, but all other political parties have been banned by the Communist Party by 1952. There's a campaign against gangs and triads in uh, eastern cities. Um, in Shanghai, 28,000 people are killed, um, and the Communist Party encourages informants to keep telling them about criminal gangs. Partly, this is a way to kind of capture the imagination and support of the law-abiding citizen, but it also it's a way of targeting people who are going to cause trouble for the Communist Party, whether through their own um, through their own kind of ideologies or just uh, because they have ideas about how to make money or run things. Every employed worker in China um, is registered uh, to a Danwei, D-A-N-W-E-I, which um, uh, is kind of a group, which through which housing, food and clothing were distributed. Um, uh, and of course, that's an easy way of controlling people. You have to be in this Danwei to get food uh, coupons. Um, and they're also assigned class labels um, according to what class they're in. Um, and these are either good, middle or bad. Um, and uh, if you were bad, then you could kind of get re-educated and perhaps move up to at least middle or at least know how to look like your middle. But there's another way of controlling the population. Um, and around the time of China's entry into the Korean War, um, terror is kicked up um, and rolled out. So an example of this is in Hubei province, H-U-B-E-I. There were 45,000 killings in October 1951, up from 220 in January 1951. Mao commented in this period of terror that killing one in a thousand people in China would be an acceptable level of terror. Um, and actually, as the terror cracks on, uh, cracks on, it is established and extended even to the Communist Party itself. An estimated, <coughs> um, we don't know how many people were killed, but an estimated amount between somewhere between 700,000, which the Communist Party admitted to, and an estimated 2 million people died um, in this terror and several million more were sent to the Lao Guy, which we'll come on to in a minute. There are also two campaigns that are used to uh, control the population around this time. Uh, first of all, the Three Antis campaign um, in December 1951, which is a campaign against waste, corruption and inefficiency. There was some public support for this because it was seen to be uh, targeting people who um, were uh, undermining the local economy. 
uh, but really it was aimed at opponents of the Communist Party uh, rather than actually clearing things up. Victims in this uh, of this anti-campaign um, often uh, were subjected to so-called struggle meetings where they would be brought before a, a crowd of people, a mob of people, and forced to admit their guilt to certain crimes in front of these people shouting abuse at them. Uh, this was expanded to the Five Antis campaign in January 1952, it's about, uh, well, about a couple of months later. Um, this was uh, to try and stimulate the economy by targeting these five things, industrial sabotage, tax evasion, bribery for fraud, and theft of government property. Um, and this was conducted as a campaign against class enemies like the bourgeoisie, um, but really it was anyone suspected of being a Kuomintang sympathiser. Uh, businessmen who were found guilty had to pay large fines. They often had to pay those in stocks in the company. And what this ended up with was that the businessman would own part of the company at the end of this process and the government would own the other part. So this allowed the government to infiltrate the business and keep an eye on it, keep an eye on him. Uh, in the future um, and it created lots of public private joint ownership businesses so that was part of the outcome so not only do they get control through terror and through intimidation and through the fines but also ongoing control through owning the businesses or part owning the businesses i've mentioned them before already but the other system that they use to gain control um, of the population in this way is the lao guy system lao guys lao G-A-I, and these are like the gulags in the Soviet Union, um, prison camps or concentration camps, we might call them. Um, there were two million people in the Laogai by 1953, half of whom, uh, about half of whom, were doing forced labour. And um, These uh, make a massive economic contribution to China. Uh, they contribute 700 million yuan um, to the economy and, and also harvest 350,000 tonnes of grain by 1955. Some of the people in the Laogai are actual criminals, ordinary criminals, but about 90% of people in the Laogai were political opponents. And the conditions in the Laogai were absolutely appalling. People were fed enough to work if they admitted their guilt. If they didn't admit their guilt, then they were subjected to torture and um, uh, and a denial of food and uh, sleep deprived until they did admit their guilt. Um, uh, and uh, we don't know how many people die in, in the Laogai, but lots of people do. Um, quite a lot of people take their own lives there. It has been estimated that maybe up to 25 million people died in the Laogai across the whole Maoist period, which would be about a million people a year um, in this period. So there we go. Um, how do the, P, uh, the Communist Party establish control uh, of the PRC? Well, they do this through a number of ways. Firstly, through military means, the redistribution, uh, sorry, the, redistribution the reunification campaigns um, around the fringe parts, but also through terror uh, of the centre um, of China. And they do it through the anti-campaigns, trying to enrol public sympathy um, on their side against these opponents who they um, say are undermining China and undermining the Communist Party as part of it. And then also through intimidation of the population through the Lao Gai, through the, through the terror campaigns um, and uh, control of the population through the informants and the downway system. So part of it's done through political means, part of it's done through intimidation and part of it's done through military um, imposition of rule. The most important of which uh, is, well, it depends really, uh, I guess, on what you're being asked. And the most important, um, I would say, in terms of establishing unity across China has to be the PLA, their re reunification campaigns. Without them, there's no doubt that Tibet would definitely have stayed independent um, and Xinjiang might have pitched for independence. And even Guangdong might have tried to unite with Taiwan as a sort of nationalist um, alternative China. Um, so without that action, uh, they wouldn't have had uh, physical control of the whole of China. However, um, within the actual um, bits that they did have control of that were already uh, under the um, authority of the Communist Party, you'd probably have to say that terror was the most important one, suppressing the people and keeping them in place, because that's what establishes the sort of rule that the PRC um, uh, runs uh, how they control China over the next 20 years or so. I hope that's useful. Um, next time we'll, we'll move on with this when we'll think about the political structure that uh, Mao puts in place to run the PRC and also the 100 Flowers campaign, which shows some of the impact um, of what we're talking about today. Thanks for watching. See you then.